Hi, everybody, and away we go with another edition of the Stampede Wrestling Show. Coming live from the Heartbeat Radio Studios, we're actually going to be having the host of our show in conversation with wrestling historian Matt Mers from Portland Wrestling. Always a pleasure to be here with you, Bob Johnson. This will be a really interesting conversation, you in conversation with the one and only Bruce Hart. Welcome back, Bruce. Uh, great to have you back on Heartbeat Radio. Oh, thanks, Bob. I'll look, I'm looking forward to uh, the show today. Let me ask you about some of the guys that were uh, were there when you were first breaking in in Stampede. I know that the Christies and the Osbournes were having a feud for the international tag belts back then. Do you have any memories of those guys? Yeah, the Osbournes were stiff. <laughs> they were kind of uh, known for potatoes. <laughs> or if anyone, I'm sure, if people know potatoes are like stiff, uh, <laughs> unintentional, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> or you know, uh, harder than they should be. Christie's were pretty good baby faces. Uh, I think Danny Crawford was I think one of the smarter. Uh, he's one of the smarter uh, guys who understood a lot of the little things he's a real good uh, source of advice and information Dan Crawford and uh, I think one of the most important things he ever told me and it's stuck with me ever since was uh, the two most important things a baby face can learn are to be able to sell and to come back with fire and and one sets up the other and he said he's never seen a, a baby face ever that didn't uh, get over if they didn't have those two things down pat. And uh, that made a huge impression on me at at the outset, and that was always one of the uh, things that I uh, imparted later on in the baby faces. And if you actually look back on it now, uh, it's you know, 100% true. I've seen a lot of guys who are not great athletes or great workers or anything, but if they had the sell and the come back down, like Ultimate Warrior... Hulk Hogan, uh, you know, I've seen all kinds of them that didn't do anything particularly auspicious or whatever, but they uh, they had the sell and the comeback down. How long had Dan been in the business when you guys uh, first teamed up there in your debut? Maybe three, four years. He'd come out. And did he Vancouver. come up there in Calgary also? Yeah, he broke in out here in the uh, late '60s with. Uh, I think a group of guys called, there was a guy named Gilles Lefish Poisson who was uh, from Montreal. Uh, um, Wayne Coleman, better known as Billy Graham Superstar. Um, mm-hmm. Abby was kind of like one of the main heels around that time, Abdullah the Butcher, and uh, another big Polynesian guy named Torquemada. And, uh, Tell me a little bit about with, Torquemada. People don't talk about him very much. Yeah, he was a great heel for us. I think he was originally from Hawaii. He had been in Kansas City for a fair bit in the 60s, but he was kind of uh, on his, uh, kind of down on his luck, and he was up in Calgary, and Danny Crawford came up with the uh, ladder match concept, and that kind of revived Kamada's career, and he became a pretty good villain for us after that, but... Uh, Real nice guy. It was a real. Uh, that was one of the other things I really noticed about most of those guys back then, uh, especially the heels. They were all, uh, you know, invariably pretty decent people. You know, <laughs> sounds like a contradiction, but uh, Stomper was a very honorable guy. Uh, Abdullah's a, a real decent, nice guy. <laughs> you know, was, uh, you know, almost all the the heels that I recall. <laughs> First thing that comes to mind is he was a nice guy. You know, and I, fans all thought they were diabolical, contemptible, you know, a-hole types. <laughs> Most of them were actually pretty good guys. You know, I think the, another one who was around right around that time was Kazuro Viziri, the Iron Sheik. Mm-hmm. He was around here right at that very time and a pretty good guy. You know, and uh, there, there Let me was throw a few, a few names at you, Bruce, that some of these guys don't... Uh... That, that people don't really talk about anymore. What about Benny Ramirez? Yeah, the the mummy from a real nice guy, Benny. Uh, he was a good friend of uh, the guy who uh, trained me, Frank Frank Butcher, Francisco Garcia. I think uh-huh. Benny was from 
South America. And he had originally been sent up here by uh, Harley Race. He had been doing the mummy gimmick down in uh, Kansas City. But he was a real good, uh, more of a mid-card guy up here. But, you know, he came up here with another Latino-type guy named Omar Atlas wrestled in some other places as Buddy Marino or something, but uh, mm-hmm. I think Omar was either the brother or stepbrother of another um, kind of Latin American guy named Cyclone Negro. Uh, they were all pretty uh, decent professionals, just, uh, you know, guys who went out there and worked pretty hard. And there's another Mexican that was half over at around that time named Manuel Quintana, a masked guy called Superhawk, and my dad seemed to like the Mexicans, and he seemed to also like the French Canadians because we had a lot of a lot of them up here, like Martel and. Uh, I know Don Gagne was there for Don Gagne, a while, wasn't he? Uh, Elias Frenchy Martin, and uh, Leo Bark. You know, they were, they were about four or five Bark brothers. They're all the real name Cormier, but uh, Leo and Bobby Bark and the Beast and. Uh, and but they're all pretty damn good workers. And then my dad had a, you know, pretty good contingent of Japanese. This guy named Mr. Hito, you know, and his real name was Adachi, and uh, another uh, pretty good Japanese guy named uh, Sakurata. There was another one. He unfortunately lost his leg up here in a car wreck uh, named Ooh. Tokyo Joe. In their own way, they were good policemen. If any of the young guys or any of the wrestlers were conducting themselves, you know, being assholes on the road or, you know, not working hard in the ring or taking, you know, shortcuts or doing anything that didn't uh, enhance the, you know, the perceptible image of the business, those guys would, uh, you know, call them out and some, in some cases kick their ass as if guys were... Uh, not uh, behaving themselves. And another guy who was a really integral old part back then was this old fart named John Foley. He yeah. had been kind of kicking around, but the closest thing I could compare him to might now might be Dave Finley in the WWE. You know, he's kind of like an old veteran on the downhill slide, but uh, always uh, went out and worked pretty hard and could have a decent match with. Almost anybody, you know, and he became a big, uh, I kind of revived him later on after I took over the book and uh, had him managing Dynamite and guys like that, you know, that, that was kind of like the apex of his career, but prior to that he had been more of a undercard uh, jobber type, you know. Tell me about uh, Teddy Okuchi. Um, we had the two, uh, it was actually three of them at the time. It was the two Japanese, uh, Chatty Yakuchi and a guy named Yasu Fuji. And uh, they had another big fat Japanese guy with them named Sikigawa, who uh, I think later on wrestled in Amarillo or some places, Pogo or something. But um, they, they were kind of uh, a different breed of Japanese than the later, you know, the, the Japanese guys I I started a bunch of them in the eighties and they were a lot more uh a lot more dynamic and hard hitting and acrobatic and athletic. Chetty and Fuji were more like uh Mr. Fuji, you know, to me more like a stereotype, uh they they would do all that you know, traditional old Kenji Shibuya Mitsu Arakawa stuff with throwing salt and uh you know, bowing, and they'd come to the ring with those wooden sandals and bullshit like that. But I didn't, I didn't uh, rate them anywhere near as good a, a worker. The, the later, like Hito Sakurada and then the Japanese guys we started in the uh, 80s were a lot more high intensity. And I think they, they worked a lot better with the guys like Brett and Dynamite and Davey. Teddy and Fuji were more like Mr. Fuji and... Uh, you know that type of thing, where it was more they they got they got heat, but they weren't what I call great workers. You know, and they didn't uh, weren't really anywhere near as good a, athletically as those other guys that we later on had a decade later. You know, what about Johnny Quinn? He was a very impressive looking big guy. He was about six five, about two seventy, and uh, 
pretty solid big worker, you know, and a uh, pretty good guy, too. I had a lot of long conversations with him uh, on a lot of those road trips, and he he a very intelligent uh, guy. He gave me a lot of good advice. Uh, I think he could have been a big, big uh, star of the breaker, too, uh, in the States. You know, I think he was out of Hamilton, Ontario, but a lot better worker than maybe uh, people remember him for, you know, but he might be a lot of this other big Hamilton guy that came along about a decade later who was similar, you know, big hard-hitting kind of guy with not quite enough fire named Iron Mike Sharp, who was in WWE for a while, but just kind of a uh, little charismatically challenged, if that's a word for it. <laughs> what about Ripper Collins? You remember him? He was up there for a little while. Yeah, he was... Uh, Kind of an old caricature of the, you know, kind of. The, he was almost like the forerunner of Adrian Adonis, you know. He played some kind of half effeminate, uh, he's kind of fat, and uh, had the high pitched voice. And uh, his real name was Roy Collins, and uh, he did his role well, you know. He never, he never drew us a lot of money. I might add, but he was all right. I didn't, I didn't mind him. He had been around a bit, you know. I'd been in L.A. and. Frisco and some of those places during the uh, Roy Shires and Mike LaBelle era, and I think he'd been a top heel in there, him, him and Buddy Austin and uh, Lonnie Main and some of those guys, but uh, he was all right, you know, he, he not not a great athlete or anything, but uh, got over in his own way, I guess, you know. But When you went to Hawaii in 1980, uh, yeah, he, were he you was surprised by what a legend he was there? To a degree, you know, uh, I don't want to digress because that, <laughs> that Hawaii thing was <laughs> a trip, as I alluded to on my last visit. You know, um, there's quite a few dynamics to that, but they, they had some interesting guys there. You know, with Ripper and uh, Mondo Guerrero was there, and Don Morocco, and a guy named Steiger, and uh, General Adnan, who was wrestling as an Indian, <laughs> Billy White Wolf, and. Uh, it, it was kind of, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Kevin Von Erich was there for a bit, and uh, Brian Blair, and uh, it was uh, <laughs> about all I could remember about Hawaii was, uh, it was, it was a good uh, likelihood of getting attacked by the fans on any given night. Most of the fans were twice as big as the wrestlers, you know, these big Samoan, like most of them were about like Omaga and FNC, you know? <laughs> and then... Uh, Beyond that, the payoffs were uh, <laughs> decidedly uh, minuscule. <laughs> so, Who was booking you know, Stampede during your formative years there? Um, initially, it was, uh, you know, uh, Stu had this old uh, guy named Dave Rule, who was kind of uh, an old crony of his, and then he was replaced by Tiger Tommaso, who was uh, up and down, didn't really have great success, and then... Uh, I think my brother Keith was booking for a while, and then the uh, aforementioned Ripper Collins was booker for a while there. And then uh, John Foley, Leo Burke, um, some guy named Gil Hayes. And then uh, my dad had Dick Steinborn in. And then Keith and Brett were booking for a stretch, and that was before I ever got a chance to book, and I... One of my biggest uh, impediments was Stu and I didn't see eye to eye on booking, you know. And I, I had a kind of a different approach to it, you know, with uh, you know just kind of storylines and heels, you know. I was a big proponent of heels, uh, you know, getting heat and uh, baby faces, kind of endeavoring to rise above adversity and. You know, all this type of stuff. And we had a lot of success. I think I took over the book, as I mentioned before, in 1980. And uh, my dad, you know, I give him credit. He, he kind of let me do my thing, so to speak, you know. And uh, at that time, it was, you know, perceived to be, I don't think he was a huge fan of smaller guys. I was like pushing all some guys like Dynamite and Davey and, uh, a lot of these smaller Japanese guys and some of these British guys like Marty Jones and uh, but it was it was uh, successful you know we we're having a, a huge kind of resurgence in business during that stretch there and uh, 
anybody that now reflects back on Stampede Wrestling, that's that's generally perceived to be the the glory days of the golden era. You know, or you you talk about all the guys who came out during that stretch. It's like uh, Dynamite and Davey and Brett and Nightheart and Jake Roberts and Junkyard Dog and uh, later Let's on. Let's talk about some uh, of those guys, Bruce. Let me throw one more of these uh, early 70s names at you. Uh, how about Larry Lane? My brother Brett and Dean and I were down in Amarillo visiting uh, our dear friends, the Funks at that time, Dory and Terry, and uh, they had this big, he'd been an amateur wrestler and wrestled with uh, people like uh, Baron Von Raschke or Jim Raschke, and uh, I think he had wrestled uh, Cosro and Iron Cheek and... Uh, Bob Backlund and some of those guys, so he's a pretty good amateur, but uh, they sent him up to uh, Calgary, and uh, the closest thing I can describe him or compare him to would be Bob Backlund, you know, in, okay. in New York in the uh, 70s, where he's kind of a pretty good ring technician, but somewhat colorless, you know, and uh, he didn't really ever draw any great business for us, but he was pretty legit, and my dad is a uh, said before was my dad was a big proponent of amateur wrestlers and liked uh, guys who could do it for real so that was yeah. one reason why he liked Larry Lane well how about in the uh, in the late 70s and early 80s a couple gentlemen came over uh, from New Zealand uh, and they were known as oh, the yeah, Kiwi Sheep Herders uh, they had oddly enough come in from Montreal at that time. They were called Sweet William and uh, Crazy Nick Carter. And that was uh, a boy, uh, Luke was Sweet William and uh, Crazy Nick was the guy who became Butch later on. But they were, uh, I thought later on, they're more of a buffoonish. I thought it was an insult to them in WWE. They were pretty serious, uh, hardcore heel type team and hardworking and. Uh, and good guys too, you know. I had a lot of respect for them, and they they tag team a lot with Dynamite in the early days when Dynamite was just getting launched as a heel. And uh, good workers, you know. They uh, worked hard every night, and they they pretty uh, they had a manager who was also a pretty good manager, a guy named Duke Savage, who was from Hawaii, and uh, they were pretty good. Uh, heel team for us uh, and they they had a lot to do with the early success of people like Brett and uh, and Keith my other brother you know, they worked a lot with them and pretty hard working uh, decent guys in and out of the ring what about another fellow from down under who uh, had a little bit of a run up there named Norman Frederick Charles III yeah we originally brought he in uh his tag team partner Jonathan Boyd. They were, I think, they originally came in from Portland. They had, they were called the Royal Kangaroos. And they were and, big stars down here for a decade. Yeah, and they they were a takeoff of this other tag team. My dad had actually started way back in the f- late fifties, called the Fabulous Kangaroos, which is Roy Heffern and Al Costello. My dad had initially paired them up, and they later on became a pretty big. Uh, draw on different territories in the states, but um, they're they're good workers. Uh, Norman and Jonathan Boyd, they you know, worked hard every night. And, uh, Norman uh, later on, I to think Jonathan went back to I'm not sure where he went back to Australia or Portland or whatever. So Norman became kind of a he was one of the main heels that helped get Dynamite Kid over when uh, I mentioned in the last program that Dynamite when he first came over was kind of pretty skinny and a lot of the cynics thought this guy's never going to get over he's you know looks like a skinny little kid and uh, Norman Frederick Charles was one of the guys that helped get Dynamite over as did this other old uh, heel named Angel Acevedo the Cuban assassin and there was a lot of guys back in those days that served that purpose you know they my dad used to refer to them as carpenters and they would uh they had this innate ability to you know get guys over there and just uh drop a fall or let them win but they they knew how to get their stuff over and norman and foley and leo burke and cuban assassin guys like that were uh that was one of the things that really uh 
made them, you know, as valuable as they were. You know, they're not not just about doing a job, but uh, doing it the right way that they got a guy over to, you know. Every territory had a few good so-called carpenters, uh, guys who uh, could get a guy, a new guy over. In a lot of cases, the new guys weren't that good, but somehow they'd, and they'd serve that purpose. And even like WWE had a lot of guys back in the day like that who were, uh, you know, guys like S.T. Jones or trying to think off the top of my head. There was a lot of them like Johnny Rods. Yeah, Johnny Rods and Barnhead guys like, uh, you know, uh, George Kadaski and Kenny J and uh, every, every, I think Portland had guys like Sandy Barr, you know, they would uh, go out with these rookies and, uh, you know, make them look better than they had any right to look. We had a guy down here named Al Madrill. Al Madrill was Al another Madrill. one. Yeah, and... Uh, there, there. Every uh, territory had uh, guys like that. Dennis Stamp down in Amarillo, and even Cyclone, and uh, you know Rip Hawk and Sweet Hans and guys like that that weren't really stars. Uh, Duke Myers and Kerry Brown were like that up here. You know, they they weren't really mainstream uh, main eventers, but uh, they did an incredible job of taking. The young guys, and we had a bunch of young guys coming up in the 80s, and I think it was like the same, like Fritz had his, his kids, or Varn had his, Jim Bruntel and Greg, and Dory Sr. had his kids, Dory Jr. and Terry, and uh, guys like that. It was these uh, veterans that would uh, go out and uh, make them look good, but also instill confidence in them, make them feel better about themselves, and there's not enough of those guys around today, you know. There's, you know, a, a few of them maybe left in the WWE, but uh, not nearly enough, you know. And, uh, Tell me about Mr. Sakurada. He and Hito, I think, were two of the main guys that spent a lot of time with Brett when they were uh, Brett was breaking in. They, they were excellent workers and uh, pretty serious, scary looking you know, at that time. Uh, and they, they look pretty imposing. Most all the Japanese guys in those days are pretty legitimately tough. So and they would test you a bit, you know, stiff you a bit, see if you had any <laughs> any metal to you. And uh, they had a lot to do with Brett's success. And uh, he wrestled, uh, I think, a little bit in the States after that. I'm not sure where he is now, if he's even alive anymore. But he and uh, this Hita were... Uh, an excellent uh, heel uh, Japanese heel tag team, and they they did a lot for people like Brett and Davy Boy and Nightheart, and uh, they brought the best out of you, you know. And uh, we uh, interesting factoid from Portland is that uh, Sakurada actually came down here in probably eighty six, eighty seven, and wrestled as Kendo Nagasaki. Oh yeah, I imagine and he would have got over to kind of do that. that. That was that was a bit of a you know at that time unfortunately the business was evolving to where Vince and all of that were you know laying waste to all the promotions but uh oh yeah it was already but, over by then yeah, yeah. but Sakurada was a hell of a worker I uh, you know very technically sound you know everything he did was pretty believable and uh, he would uh, kick your ass <laughs> as well for <laughs> you know uh, making him look bad if you're doing things that weren't uh, worth selling. You know, he's he a pretty legit tough guy, you know, so you had to... Let me uh, ask you about a couple other foreign menaces here. What about Gama Singh? Yeah, Kadabra Sahota. The, he, I, uh, I had a lot of success with him, and uh, he had been around, kicking around since around the time when I was breaking in. I think he was down in the dungeon with me and Rick Martell and all like that, and, He's originally from Vancouver area or somewhere in BC, but uh, oh, pretty good guy, you know, nice, uh, nice person, you know, pretty well liked, honorable guy, you know. And, um, he'd been a baby face for most of that time and had never really done any great business, so I, I switched him to a heel, you know, and he. Uh, adopted the name the Great Gamma, you know, which is sort of a throwback to some. 
old guy from the Strangle Lewis era, an old yeah. Indian wrestler from the 1920s or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so right around that time, there was this big uh, controversy with some plane, Air Canada plane was bombed by Sikh terrorists or something like that. So I see, that kind really? Of, yeah, and that that became kind of the, uh, so we had him in this, you know, big, uh, overweight, uh, and we've been kind of a mid-card heel up here named Mike Shaw, and we uh, ordained, uh, ordained him. It was kind of cheesy, but we had this big solemn ceremony in the ring where he became a born-again Pakistani, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden was wearing a turban, and we had them playing, uh, it was really annoying, this Ravi Shankar, you know, sitar music at full blast in the rings during, during his matches, <laughs> burning incense, and uh, we changed their name. At that time, the big TV series hit of the year was called Miami Vice, so we called them the Karachi Vice, and uh, oddly enough, a lot of tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, whatever, but it got over huge, and uh, we had some good young baby faces to feed them at that time, Mike Shaw and Gamma. And I think the most prominent one was my brother Owen, who was, you know, really uh, a dynamic young baby face. And then we had Chris Benoit and Brian Pillman and uh, another young Japanese guy named uh, Kichi Yamada, who is better known to people as Jushin Liger, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it took off, that whole thing. It kind of revived and rejuvenated Gamma, you know, and he became like the, uh, you know, one of the corner pieces, cornerstone heels in the territory. And Mike Shaw, as Malcolm Singh, became a, you know, a, a, a hot ticket. And we had a, a lot of uh, pretty good business out of that, you know. Didn't Owen kind of get a started with uh, doing something with uh, a Mike oh, Shaw there that, that, when he was doing the marketing thing? That was the launch of Owen's. Uh, Owen was just sort of starting, and that, that became his big uh, rival, Owen Hart and Muck and Singh. And then right around that time, I had this other guy who had just been fired by WWE. He had been kind of a, a career jobber named Barry O. Barry Orton's his real name brother of Randy and uncle of Red, uh, the brother of Cowboy Bob and uncle of Randy Orton. But uh, so he had asked me about coming in around that time. I think he just left WWE on bad terms. And uh, I said, oh, I don't really have any desire to bring in some uh, guy who's been squashed by WWE. And, you know, in those days, they didn't have Monday Night Raw. They used to have these studio squash matches with Guys like Barry O and uh, you know Ted Grizzly and uh, the Marcus yeah. brothers getting squashed every week. So, so we came up with this idea where he was going to come in under a mask and uh, gave him the name the Zodiac. And uh, it was actually pretty cutting edge stuff. He used to go into some recording studio. He he knew somebody had a studio and he would cut these uh, promos with all these weird sound effects and stuff on them, and then he would lip sync to his own pre-cut promos later on, and people were kind of spooked out by it because they thought he had That's interesting. talked like that. And, uh, and we had this other uh, guy who had been kind of a, mostly an undercard heel named Carl Moffat, and we uh, brought him in with the hockey goalie mask, you know, as Jason the Terrible, and, and Zodiac was his manager, kind of like Dr. Frankenstein. And I was told later on that was kind of the uh, the inspiration for Mark Calloway and Paul Bearer, the Undertaker, and uh, Paul Bearer in on. But it was... Uh, it got over really good, and they uh, Moffat Moffat took pretty good bumps, and Barry was uh, excellent ring general. So we had a lot of success with like Pillman and I were doing Bad Company. We worked a lot with Barry and Moffat and Owen, and uh, my brother-in-law Ben Basarab and uh, Benoit had a lot of success with Barry and uh, Moffat and uh, Gamma and Muckham Singh, you know. And, Bruce, I got a I got a, a caller just called in, uh, Len J. Phillips from Edmonton, and Len is asking, 
can you ask Bruce Hart to tell us uh, Ed Whelan's story? Yeah, I won't digress too much. Ed Whelan was our commentator, and uh, I would say the best commentator I've ever heard. You know, he was kind of a huge part of the uh, success of Stampede Wrestling, and the main reason he was as good as he was is he uh, he wouldn't put anything over unless he thought it was worth putting over and he, in his own way kind of uh made the wrestlers kind of uh keep it pretty serious and he wasn't a big proponent of hot shotting and uh shortcuts and stuff so but he, he was head and shoulders above anything i've ever heard in wwe as far as a commentator goes and any fans out there that haven't uh heard you know they should check out some old archival videos Everything seen, seemed to uh, contribute in a positive way. The Ed Whalens and, and you know the wrestlers and the managers and the, and the referees and th- that was a big reason why we were successful. Is uh, everything seemed to uh, serve some good purpose, you know. So, but. Tell me about Killer Khan. Ozawa, you know, he was uh, a big, ugly, uh, monster-looking Japanese heel and. Uh, Right around that time, you know, I, I, I had been, uh, initially we had kind of just uh, one heel faction in Stampede Wrestling, which is most of the main heels were managed by this so-called millionaire, J.R. Foley, and he, he had like, David Schultz and uh, Dynamite Kid and uh, Duke Myers and Kerry Brown, and right around that time I I had a ton of these Japanese guys uh, land in the territory, and business was booming. We had 10 or 12 <laughs> top heels at that time, including Georgie Takano, the Cobra, and Killer Khan, uh, Ozawa, and uh, and Bad News Allen, and uh, I had another Japanese kind of assistant manager to Foley named uh, Wakamatsu, and, uh, and Gamma, and Mike Shaw, like, in addition to Dynamite, who was an incredible heel, and uh, Myers and Brown and David Schultz and Honky Tonk you know, all at the same time. So if any anybody who knows any of those names go, wow, that's an incredible uh, amalgamation of heels. So I came up with this concept uh, around that time. We were having a, we had just baby faces and those heels, and uh, I came up with the idea of having two warring heel factions and. Uh, so at one point they had some kind of a double cross perpetrated with I think Gamma and the Cobra double crossed uh, Dynamite or something but so now we had the two warring heel factions and that was the genesis for the very first ever triple threat match which I originally called the uh, Bermuda Triangle match and it was uh, Dynamite Kid Davy Boy and uh, Georgie Takano the Cobra and uh, and uh, that became a huge ticket in in Stampede. Now, where we had the uh, the warring heel factions, so uh, Wakamatsu was managing, I think Bad News and most of the Japanese guys, and Ozawa and Foley was managing Dynamite and da- I mean Dynamite and David Schultz and uh, Duke Myers and Kerry Brown and Honky Tonk, and so it became a huge ticket, and it was a concept that was later on borrowed or ripped off by WWE, which changed the name to Triple Threat. You know, I, I think Bermuda Triangle was still a better name for it. But uh, Does this match and, exist on video? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I, I'm sure it is somewhere, you know. And That, that was uh, just another of the many little concepts that kind of emanated from Stampede that, uh, you know, invariably WWE uh, doesn't really give credit for whatever what is the situation with the stampede wrestling video library how much is there is it all owned by wwe i know brett owns Um, apparently footage with him or what's the stitch i don't even know you know and whatever transpired was done i hate to make myself sound like a moron but uh it was done without really any consultation from me you know and i think they engineered some deal with others in my family or some shit and uh they haven't frankly done anything with it you know tell me about larry cameron yeah larry was another one you know i had this friend in minnesota named eddie sharkey who uh 
he had broken in Hawk and Animal and uh, Barry Jarso, the Repo Man, and uh, North the Barbarian, and uh, some of those guys, I think even Backland, and my dad had him in back up in the 60s, but I remember he called me up and uh, said he had a black guy, a football player, he was uh, highly recommended and asked if we could bring him in and uh he was pretty green at the time, Larry, but a really uh, willing to learn, you know, easy to get along with type. And I uh, gave him the name Lethal Larry Cameron. And uh, I, we had a lot of success with some of these uh, black heels like Bad News Allen and Abdullah the Butcher and Sweet Daddy Seeky. So I sort of uh, gave him a pretty good push. You know, we didn't have too many other really auspicious main heels at that time. And he was working a lot with uh, my brother Owen, and uh, I think I worked with him a bit, and um, a few of the other guys, maybe Pillman did, and and uh, he got over pretty damn good, you know. And I, I I have no doubt he, after he left here, he uh, kind of sad to re- relate. He, uh, I think he was over in uh, Europe or something and died of a heart attack in, in the dressing room. Mm, that's very good sad. guy, though. Tell me about Kerry Brown before and after Rip Rogers showed up in Stampede. Yeah, Kerry Brown was uh, originally sent out here by his uncle, Bulldog Bob Brown, and uh, he was originally supposed to be a baby face, and then uh, I, t- I switched him heel and had him kind of tagging with Duke Myers, who was an excellent kind of mentor to him. And He, he was a great worker, Kerry Brown. He uh, worked hard every night and took great bumps and was uh, he was a huge benefit to us, you know, and I was frankly surprised he never WWE or something, because uh, he reminded me of an earlier version of Kevin Owen, you know, the same kind of thing, and uh, and if he had gotten the same kind of push that Kevin Owen got, I'm sure people would be talking about him to this day as being uh, one of the great workers of his of his era, you know, really good worker, good guy to have in the dressing room, and he was another of those guys who uh, went out and made all, the, you hear about all those baby faces, the legendary ones that came out of Stampede, like Owen and Benoit and Davey and uh, Brett and Pillman and Jericho and guys like that. And uh, it was guys like Kerry Brown and Duke Myers and the Cuban assassin, Ron Starr, that, uh, you know, were huge, you know, components in that whole thing. You know, they, they really... Uh, went out and not only got those guys over it, but they taught them how to work and uh, instilled a lot of the, you know, the most important aspects of selling and coming back and getting confidence and that type of thing. Tell me about Rip Rogers. Yeah, another guy. He's another really uh, had a good grasp of ring psychology and uh, a nice guy, too. You know, I, uh, almost all the guys I'm talking to are all pretty good guys in the in the dressing room and on the road, you know, and very rarely did you ever have any uh, problems or whatever. But Rip was another of those guys. I was told that Rip had been a integral part of, uh, and had a lot of success with uh, the legendary Randy Poffo, Randy Macho Man Savage, before uh, Randy ever had his big uh, splash with WWE. But Rip was another of those real steady veterans who, he knew how to get heat and how to tell a story and uh, would take some bumps. And uh, whenever you worked with Rip, you're always pretty steady. You had a pretty good uh, feeling of, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a good match. I have a caller from uh, Toronto, Harold. Harold asked me, uh, Bruce, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Tiger Khan. Yeah, unfortunately, uh died way too soon. He, he, he was... I, I met him, and he was Marlon Kalki, but Tiger Khan out of Queens, New York. And uh, he came up here and was uh, a really excellent addition when we were relaunching uh, Stampede Wrestling about a decade or around 2000 or somewhere around that time. And he was a huge component in getting my nephew Harry, uh, David Hart Smith, and Tyson Kidd, and uh, Rick Victor, and just, you know, a really uh, decent uh, guy in and out of the dressing room, the ring, everything, you know. And almost all the guys I talk about, and I'm sure most ever 
others talk about in this business is a lot of the reasons why they're so good is behind the scenes, you know, what they offer in the dressing room and, and on the road. And, uh, you know, that, that's a big part of it and uh, something that's all too often missing in the business these days. I definitely want to talk about that era some more. But first, I'd yeah, like to oh, just get through a few of those names uh, that went on to uh, stardom in the WWE that you were really instrumental in, you know, getting them that look in, in I think, people's opinion. Uh, if these guys hadn't been through Stampede, they may have never gone on to their success in WWF. Uh, first and foremost would probably be maybe uh, Wayne Ferris, who went on to become the Honky Tonk Man. Yeah, he was another guy who uh, he was sent in by his uh, good friend David Schultz. and uh, He was one of those guys, Honky Tonk, who uh, wasn't a mark for himself. He uh, went out and uh, kind of was a caricature of of a wrestler but that was what got him over he knew you know uh, he was sort of you know uh, almost making a mockery you know the greatest intercontinental champion of all time with the guitars and uh, whatever but he knew how to get heat and he uh, he stuck to what he was good at and, uh, what was the gimmick in Stampede that he was doing he was the honky tonk man and, and he was initially tag team with David Schultz and they were a heel tag team and then he double crossed Schultz, and Schultz became a face and became a huge face up here. And then, Hong really? Kong later, he later on worked a lot with uh, Owen and uh, and some of those guys when they were uh, just getting started and he was pretty steadying. Uh, you know, he knew how to get heat. And all those guys, they uh, they did, you know like Malcolm Singh and Bad News all. Of, they just sort of stuck to what they were good at and see them trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel or anything like that. They mm-hmm. and they they knew how to get heat and they knew how to uh, work a crowd and they knew how to get the other guy over and they uh, stuck to it and, uh, you know, all had, they had success pretty well, well everywhere they went. Bruce, if you could tell our fans of Heartbeat Radio about uh, Wayne's Haunty Tonk. Uh, at the at the uh, Red Deer Inn in Red Deer uh, it was a, a, a vignette that we used to do. Bruce came up with this brilliant idea. Yeah, it was kind of a maybe a takeoff on Piper's Pit type thing, but we had honky tonk in some bar setting with uh, conducting interviews, and uh, he did a hell of a job. You know, he's just kind of being being obnoxious, and most of the guys he's conducting interviews with were like these. Bill Kazmaier, the world's strongest man, and uh, I think that's as I said before, the biggest reason for his success is he uh, he didn't mind uh, kind of making a fool of himself you know, under the guise of pretending he was the greatest hockey, the uh, greatest North American or intercontinental champion of all time. You know, and, you know some of the new heels coming up could uh, learn a lot from taking a look at people like uh, Honky Tonk and uh, maybe uh, Roddy Piper in his heel days and all, and, you know, seeing the uh, kind of the satiric, uh, sarcastic humor to it. Tell me a little bit about David Schultz. Yeah, one of the great, great uh, interviews ever in this business. You know, he's had an incredible uh, gift of... Uh, you know, that flamboyant art of talking, you know, and uh, pretty good heel, too. You know, he did a lot of business up here, you know, and he, he was an excellent uh, component up here because at that time we had a lot of uh, some other heels that were pretty pretty damn good at that time, like Dynamite at that time and uh, the aforementioned Kerry and Duke and I think Bad News. But Schultz was really bombastic, dynamic. Uh, he was almost like Roddy Piper, magnified as far as uh, just that really outrageous personality and I'm not sure if too many fans it's a shame that they maybe don't even know of him you know I, I don't know what happened in that infamous charade with John Stossel and he got kind of blackballed and whatever by the WWE and if that hadn't happened he'd, he'd be like one of those mainstream uh, heels that everybody talks about today in the same you know, light as a Roddy Piper, or, uh, you know, uh, a Stone Cold Steve Austin, or he was like one of those guys who was really uh, 
incredible, had a ton of charisma and uh, knew how to get himself over, you know, and it, I had nothing but high regard for him. Let me ask you about a couple of guys who went on to be two of the most loved WWF superstars of all time who had uh, runs in Stampede. First of all was was the junkyard dog who worked up there as Big Daddy Ritter. Yeah, I I ran into him in, uh, overseas, and uh, he was pretty much down on his luck. And uh, I sort of asked my dad as a favor if, I could, if uh, he could book him, and... Uh, he came in and was just called Big Daddy Ritter. His real name is Sylvester Ritter. And uh, at that time, we uh, we had another big black heel named Casavubu who took sick and I think ended up dying of kidney disease. So we kind of pushed uh, Big Daddy Ritter, you know, in his place. And it was right around that time we had a few green baby faces like Brett and uh, this other big kind of pretty good bullshitter, uh, Jake Roberts, who was just getting his feet wet then, and uh, they had pretty good chemistry, and I had uh, Big Daddy is kind of playing uh, almost like an earlier day version of the Godfather, you know, kind of a quasi-pimp or whatever, and uh, he got over pretty good, you know, and uh, I was happy for his subsequent success, albeit as a baby face, his junkyard dog, you know, he, I think left our territory and went down to Bill Watts' Louisiana uh, territory and uh, did the junkyard dog thing as a baby face and uh, uh, to his credit took off. So uh, good guy, though. I uh, no, Nothing but uh, good things to say about him. Tell me a little bit about Jake Roberts. Uh, Jake was uh, a guy who, uh, for want of a better term, got it. You know, he understood how to get over. He knew how to, you know, market himself, and he understood the ring psychology quite implicitly, and uh, he had a lot of success, you know, uh, because of that. He was only a marginal athlete, not, you know, didn't do that much, but by that token, he was smart enough to realize to stick to what he was good at and not try to enter saw Drake, Jake trying to throw a drop kick or do a cartwheel or you know, uh, jump off the top of uh, a cage or anything like that, but uh, fully deserving of the success he's had, you know, and I hope he's overcome some of the demons and things that have held him back the last decade or so. But, uh, you know, I definitely understood how to get over and, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty savvy old professional Jake. When you were first breaking in back in the early 70s, what was the relationship like back then between your dad and Gene in British Columbia and what was going on over in uh, Quebec? Uh, was there a relationship oh, between the Canadian promotions? My dad, like a uh, lot of the guys of his era, was, uh, he, he very much uh, felt committed to uh, upholding the uh, ostensible integrity or you know the you know the the old national wrestling alliance and this bond or brotherhood between the promoters and he would never screw another promoter and there's there's a lot of respect you know as far as uh and you know, what the territorial boundary boundaries were you know he'd never run into somebody else's territory and never steal guys from another promoter and all that type of thing and uh that was in some ways detrimental later on because uh, some of the other guys weren't so inclined, you know. And, uh, but my or my dad uh, sacrificing, you know, to accommodate a guy like Gene Kaniski or uh, I think even later on Vince McMahon because of his relationship with Vince Sr. and uh, Jim Barnett, guys like that, you know. You know, it was kind of an unwritten... Uh, sense of honor or integrity where you worked with those guys, helped each other, uh, didn't screw them, didn't steal their talent, didn't run in their towns. And uh, I think a lot of that uh, was thrown out the window later on. And uh, I think it was uh, bothered my dad quite a bit because he played by the rules. It reminded me a bit of that uh, movie, The Godfather, you know, hit the Marlon Brando character my my dad reminded me a lot of that character and he's you know 
sewing, sewing Sonny and, uh, you know, the uh, Tom Hagen or the Robert Duvall character, you know, even though this is, you know, the mafia, he still got to operate by the rules. And uh, he was like that. And it kind of bothered him that a lot of the others uh, didn't, you know, and uh, it was kind of the uh, undoing of the whole thing. When you look from the outside, Bruce, it, it seems like your father had a working relationship a little bit with Vern Gagne and Fritz von Erich and Don Owen, rather than, say, the Crockett's uh, and the Grams and Bill Watts and kind of that eastern side of the, uh, yeah, the continent. Yeah, I think a big part of it, you know, it's, some people don't know, but my dad broke Fritz von Erich in up here in the 50s. My dad worked a lot in Minneapolis when he was just breaking uh, kind of early in his career, and Vern Gagne and company were around there at that time. And My dad had done some stuff in the West Coast. My dad had broken in Kaniski and Sandor Kovacs, who were promoters out there. And I think my dad knew another old guy named Cliff Parker, who was part of that. And uh, So my dad sort of you know, felt it was obligatory to uh, honor, you know, those guys were friends, and my dad had a lot of empathy. He uh, knew how he would have felt if somebody else was trying to steal his boys or run an opposition in his territory and things like that, you know, it was, you know, kind of abhorrent, you know, was, you know, uh, sign of somebody who's a traitor and a you know, a low life piece of crap. You know? So, my dad, uh, but I think a big part of a lot of those, as well as uh, my dad's amateur background and all like that, and quite a few of those guys had a similar. Uh, I know my dad was especially uh, had a very good relationship with Tory Funk Sr., who was an old amateur, and Vern Gagne was an old amateur, and Bob Geigel was an old amateur, and so I think that that kind of meant a lot to people like my dad, you know, if you see some of those old promoters from back then, I know my dad had great respect for Luthez, who was kind of a integral part of the St. Louis promotion with Sam Muchnick, he was like the world champion for a long time, and kind of the uh, figurehead. Tell me about uh, when Owen was first coming up in the game. Did you train him, Bruce? Were you handling yeah, all those guys at that like, time well, in the dungeon? Yeah, I'd probably be overstating myself if I took a lot of credit for his success because he was just gifted and had uh, a lot of... Uh, I think one of the main things that enabled Owen to be as good as he was is he... Uh, he had seen so much being the baby of the family. He had seen things that had gone right and things that had gone wrong. He had seen what had worked for Brett and Keith and Davy and Dynamite and all these others. And uh, he kind of understood that. And one of the most frustrating parts for me with Owen uh, was that, uh, quite honestly, WWE uh, misused him and wasted his talent, you know, and um, he was, in my estimation, uh, a lot better athlete than Brett and a lot better worker, you know, uh, but he never really got the push, and the push that they gave him was, you know, kind of uh, ass backwards, in my estimation. He was far better suited to be a baby face, and anyone who ever saw him in Stampede would tell you that. He was close to the equivalent, I could say, would be Brian Danielson or Daniel Bryan, when they had him as a heel for however long, he was more spinning his wheels, and then they switched him into a face, and he became a huge star. And uh, I think Owen would have been the same if he had uh, had the opportunity. You know, nonetheless, you know, he still did all right in WWE, but uh, not even not even close to what he was really capable of, you know, and uh, it's kind of uh, regrettable that he's, you know, not remembered more for that, you know, and uh, they tend to think of him as Brett's little brother, you know, but uh, he, he was, uh, you know, a genuine, genuine great worker without any ifs, ands, or buts, you know, and never really uh, got a chance to 
show that in WWE. You know, he's way better than anyone uh, in WWE had any idea of, you know. Tell me about Brian Pillman. Did you train Brian Pillman? Love, yeah, another one, you know, another guy who unfortunately died way too young. and uh, He was like one of the most kind of uh, inventive, creative, conscientious, cutting-edge guys you've ever seen. He's always, you know, 24-7 trying to think of new ideas and new concepts. And he, he was uh, legitimately... Uh, great athlete, you know, he played pro football, you know, as a middle linebacker in the NFL at 220 pounds, which is almost unheard of, you know, because, uh, but yeah, he was, a, he was a really good athlete, really intense, and uh, one of the best interviews in the business, you know, had a really uh, gift of uh, kind of articulating saddest words in the human in the English language uh, as my dad used to say or what might have been you know and uh, that's, that's to me one of the saddest things about three of my uh, treasured uh, associates in W and Stampede Wrestling were Dynamite Kid Owen and Brian Pillman and none of them in my estimation even though they're remembered pretty well by fans and all none of them even came close to uh, being anywhere near as good as they really had been in Stampede. You know, they all uh, either were compromised by injuries or accidents or bad booking or all of the above, you know. And all three were really good people, too, you know, beyond that. You know, they, uh, they you know, put their hearts and souls into the business and, uh, you know, uh, deserve to be remembered a lot more favorably, really, than they have been. I want to know about the first time you met Chris Benoit. And when we used to wrestle up in Edmonton every Saturday night, and uh, there was this little quiet kid who was, uh, he was like so shy and nervous when he, he idolized Dynamite Kid. That was like his ultimate idol. And uh, just, just from the point of being a, a mark, he was in, in, in for I don't know how many years when Dynamite was in his prime and stampede, you'd see Benoit down there and he just be uh, and wide-eyed watching. It was like uh, some kid watching uh, Wayne Gretzky or Magic Johnson or Michael Jordan and that type of thing. And then when we uh, started up the promotion again in 1985, Benoit came down to Calgary and uh, Vince had basically taken almost all our top talent, you know, and that effing abortion of a takeover with he took Davy and Dynamite and Brett and Nightheart and Schultz and Bad News and whoever and all that. But so I was starting a bunch of green guys and Benoit hitchhiked down to Calgary and uh, I had all these rookies at that time, which was Owen and Ben Basarab and uh, Liger, Jushin Liger, Kichi Amata and and Pillman and uh, it was. Uh, an incredibly conscientious, diligent group, though they're all, they listened to everything I told them, and I spent a lot of time just schooling them on a lot of the subtleties and, the, you know, things that don't meet the eye about the business, and uh, they're all very uh, eager to learn and uh, dedicated, and, you know, to their credit, every one of them uh, became, not, not only uh, got into the business, but they all became kind of like cutting-edge you know, uh, stars yeah, that almost uh, later on everyone else was copying, you know. And so Benoit was a really nice, nice quiet, dedicated, uh, diligent, uh, conscientious kid, you know. And, uh, it's, you know, one of the sad chapters in our business, what happened to him, I, like everyone else, have no real idea what uh, what the hell transpired there, you know. But, uh I have not, nonetheless nothing but good memories of him. You know, as a great worker, and a, I remember him as a very good, decent person. You know, it sounds like a contradiction given what happened, but um, I still uh, consider him uh, one of the greats. I'm hope hopeful, you know, that uh, out of the ashes of all the shit, <laughs> you know, everything's been kind of desecrated and, you know, torched and scorched earth or whatever the hell, you know, but uh, 
I'm hoping at some point the uh, geniuses in Connecticut uh, open their eyes and uh, recognize that uh, they need to re-sow some seeds at the grassroots and they need to revisit. While well, some of these people are still alive, still take advantage of you know people like Terry Funk or uh, Harley Race or uh, you know Greg Gagne or uh, you know people that are maybe down in Portland or wherever you know and. Uh, they should be uh, tapping into that wealth of knowledge, and they, they should also be resowing the seeds in each of those places, you know, because if they don't, then the future of the business is uh, pretty precarious and contrary to any of the bullshit that uh, ratings are better than ever, or, you know, they got a buy rate, or, you know, anyone that knows anything about the business knows that the foundation's in pretty dire uh, state right now and hopefully uh, they will uh, open their eyes and uh, do something about it rather than be whistling in the dark while the Titanic is going down. I'd like to just take the opportunity to thank Matt all too often I am doing interviews when the you know the interviewers aren't asking intelligent questions or they don't you know and, I, I very much uh, appreciated the fact that Matt had done some homework and, uh, you know, had some genuine first-hand understanding of, you know, the issues and the people and all like that. So it certainly, uh, you know, uh, made for a lot more compelling interview for me and I was a lot more enjoyable and fulfilling, you know. I appreciate you not trying to work me on any of the answers. <laughs> yeah, my my pleasure. <laughs>